Do you want to study God's Word in greater depth, but you can't leave town or your job to attend seminary? Faith Theological Seminary of Catonsville is a Bible-believing, evangelical, non-denominational seminary with professors that have earned PhDs in their fields of instruction. We have a beautiful campus on North Rolling Road, just west of the city of Baltimore. We offer Biblical Studies degrees at the Associates and Bachelor's levels, along with a Master of Divinity in Chaplaincy and a Doctor of Ministry in Expository Preaching. Our tuition is affordable, and some scholarships are available. We operate under an exemption from the Maryland Higher Education Commission, granting us authority to offer advanced educational instruction and degrees in religious studies. Visit our website at ftscatonsville.org or call our offices at 410-788-6132. We look forward to seeing you study God's Word with us. Take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. Would you take God's Word today and open, please, to the book of 2 Corinthians? We are continuing our study in 2 Corinthians. I want you to find chapter 8 this morning, and we're going to look at verses 1 to verse 15, by the grace of God. I don't know if we're going to get all that in, but uh, would you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia, how that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take us upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints." And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. And I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the frowardness of forwardness, excuse me, of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. This is God's precious word. You may be seated. May God help us to hear today with the help of the Holy Spirit. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, as we come before you today, we always acknowledge our need of you, Lord, in this matter of worship. Part of it is the way we hear the Word of God, the way we reverently listen, always ready, Lord, to apply truth to life and to make the corrections in our own life, Lord, whenever we're confronted with the mirror of God's Word. So, Lord, give us ears to hear with the help of the Holy Spirit and do your work in every heart and every life. And for those who don't know Christ, I pray that they would come to know Jesus Christ truly as Savior and Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, there are a few topics more sensitive than that of money. Someone said the most sensitive nerve in the human body is the one that goes from the hand to the pocketbook. Any mention of giving is perceived to be by some as inappropriate. By others, they see it maybe as even being offensive. There are critics who are always uh, ready to accuse church leaders of constantly appealing for money and then accuse them of of abusing perhaps the money that they've already received. Unfortunately, some of those accusations are true in in a lot of churches. I tell you, I'm so very grateful for the men that we have here at Grace that faithfully deal with our finances and do such a tremendous job. And every year we give account by having a, a meeting in March to show what the Lord has done and to give full accountability to all that is taken in. Unfortunately, it's not that way in every place. Uh, The subject of money has been 
preached on and abused by some. Um, there are some out there with putting pressure on people to give, rel religious hucksters who carry out these campaigns, not to advance the kingdom of God, but more to advance their own kingdom and their own agenda and to pad their own pockets. And in the face of all this abuse, there are some who might think, well, you know, perhaps you should avoid preaching on money altogether. But that's not right either, because if you're going to faithfully preach the word of God, this subject is going to come up. For example, there are 500 verses in the Bible that pertain to faith, 500 verses in the Bible that talk about the topic of prayer. There are 2,350 verses in the Bible that talk about the topic of money. And if you're going to preach through the Bible, you're going to come upon this topic, and every church and every believer has to understand God's will with respect to material things and money in our own life. This is a significant part of your Christian life and your Christian walk. And so what we're doing here is we're just simply preaching through 2 Corinthians, and we finished chapter 7 last week, and now we come up in chapter 8, and we're going to talk about this subject of giving because this is exactly what Paul talks about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. One of Paul's major ministries was collecting, taking up a big collection for the poor saints in the church in Jerusalem. The saints in the church in Jerusalem were very impoverished, and so Paul wanted to help out. And so on his third missionary journey, he went from church to church collecting an offering that he might present it to the poor saints that were there in Jerusalem. He collected offerings from Galatia, from Macedonia, from Achaia, from Asia Minor. Why did Paul take up this special offering? Well, because there was a crisis in the church at Jerusalem. The saints there were very poor. You say, why? Well, because Jewish pilgrims, when they came to worship at the feast days, many of them were converted to Christ. You remember on the day of Pentecost, how many were saved? 3,000. And then a few days later, 5,000 were added to the church. These were Jewish pilgrims. And rather than going back to their home, they wanted to stay in Jerusalem. And it's not hard to understand that. There's, that was the only church back then. And God was doing miraculous things there. And, and they had fellowship there. Miracles were happening there. There was great excitement there. And so they stayed at the church. But the problem was absorbing all of these people and helping them to get re-rooted there in Jerusalem. And many people in the church were taking on these, these, these pilgrims that were now members of that church. They were opening up their homes and their resources were beginning to run out. But on top of that, many in Jerusalem lost their job because when they converted to Jesus Christ, Orthodox Jews rejected them. They were alienated, disowned by their family, lost their job, lose, they lost their business, lost their source of income, and so they were dependent upon the help of others in that church. And then you add to that the Roman economy, Roman taxation was, was incredible. Um, you know, we, we, we pay high taxes today, but it was nothing compared to what the Romans were doing to the people back in that time. They were strangling the people with money that was causing poverty. And then there was also a worldwide famine that hit right at that time. The Bible talks about that in Acts chapter 11. So what you have here is the perfect storm, and the saints in the church in Jerusalem were impoverished. Now, the church in Jerusalem that responded, they did the best that they could, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common, verse 45, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. What was the response of the church? Well, they would sell their possessions and give the money to the apostles, and the apostles would use that money and give it to the needy brethren that were there in the church in Jerusalem. But pretty soon, they ran out of things to sell. And what you had basically there then was a, a, a huge church of people that were all impoverished, even the ones that sold all their possessions to help out others. And so there was help that was needed from the outside. And in Acts chapter 11, verse 29, it says, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now, Saul took this burden on himself. Saul wanted to help out those believers that were suffering there in Jerusalem and in Judea. And uh, he wanted to take money from Gentile churches, collections and offerings from Gentile churches, and give it to the church in Jerusalem. And part of the reason he wanted to do this was to show the unity of the church. Here are Gentile churches 
taking up a love offering for Jewish believers. And what he was doing, he was showing the barrier, the racial barrier was torn down. And there's nothing but love in the body of Christ. There's nothing but oneness in the body of Christ. And so this was a great opportunity to demonstrate to the world that the middle wall of partition had been torn down. And there was nothing but love between the believers. And so Paul had a passion to take up this offering and present it to the Jerusalem church. He mentions it in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He talks about this offering. He says this in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, verse number 1. Now concerning the collection, there we are, for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So Paul is saying to these churches, get your collection together, get your offering together, so that when I come, I'll take that offering, and I will be accompanied by others as we take this offering to uh, Jerusalem to give to the saints there. Now, at first, the church at Corinth, they were participating in this offering. But something happened to where the church at Corinth stopped. They were giving, they made a commitment to give, to help, but then they stopped. And why did they stop? Well, if you've been with us in our study of 2 Corinthians, you know that there was a split between Paul and the church of Corinth. And why was that? Because false teachers had entered into the church of Corinth, and they began to attack the credibility and character of Paul. They questioned his credentials as an apostle. They totally undermined his character. They criticized him in every way. And pretty soon, the people in the church of Corinth began to doubt Paul's credibility. And if you doubt the credibility of the preacher, then they stop giving. We're not going to give to this, this offering that Paul's taking up for these believers. They totally stopped. You know, sometimes when people get mad at the preacher, they stop giving. And let, let me just say, if that ha is that you, if you're mad at me for some reason? If you are, I don't know it. If somebody's mad at me, I have no idea. And I, uh, furthermore, I have no idea what you give. I don't, I don't check the records. I know some pastors, first thing you do on Monday morning is they check the record to find out who gave what. And I want to tell you that in my life, I've never done that. I have absolutely no idea what anyone in this church gives in the offering plate. That's none of my business. That's between you and God. Our men count that up, and that's all kept private because it's an act of worship between you and the Lord. And so if you're not giving because you're mad at me, I have no idea about that. All right? I have no idea. And by the way, if, if, if you stop giving because you're mad at someone, you, need, you probably don't have the right motive for giving to begin with. And this is exactly what Paul is going to address here to the church at Corinth. They stopped giving, and now... You remember last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul, after he wrote a severe letter to the Corinthians, rebuking them for their behavior, he was waiting to find out the response from Titus. And finally, he, find, he found out when he met Titus in Macedonia that the Corinthian church had repented and that they had shown the signs of true repentance. And now Paul is asking for reconciliation to the church and now he feels comfortable about bringing up the offering again. Hey, now that we're getting reconciled, now that we're back in fellowship, remember that offering that you all were giving? He wants to bring it back up because he wants them to follow through on what they originally promised. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 is where the Apostle Paul deals with this whole issue of giving and, and the offering, and the right motive for giving. He's talking to the Corinthians about this. And really, he kind of sums it up in chapter 9. Look down at chapter 9, verse 13. Notice what he says there. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men, and by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. In other words, what Paul is saying there is the result of your gift and your giving will glorify God and they will all know that it's a result of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When this offering goes back to the saints in Jerusalem, these Jewish believers, 
they're going to know that this was the work of the gospel and of the grace of God, and they're going to glorify God. They're going to give God glory for this. And then Paul, at the end of chapter 9, sums up the whole reason and the whole motive behind why we should ever give. Look at verse 19, or excuse me, verse 15 of chapter 9. Notice how he sums up this whole section. Thanks be unto God for his, what, unspeakable gift. What is Paul saying there? And this is the sum of his whole message. In response to God's indescribable gift, we should be generous givers. That's the whole point. Paul knew it was going to be hard to reignite the desire in the Corinthians to give, but Paul does it by reminding them that our giving is in response to God's indescribable gift. And what is his indescribable gift? It's Jesus Christ. Our giving is in response. It's in gratitude. It's in heartfelt gratitude to the indescribable gift of Jesus Christ to us and all that he did for us when he came on the cross. I love the song that Devin just sang that really summarized the whole thing about Jesus Christ who bore our sin, who took the wrath of our sin upon himself, took all the blame for our sin upon himself so that we could be forgiven, so that we could stand forgiven and we could have eternal life in heaven because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. What does that mean to you? I want to tell you, beloved, that's the greatest gift ever. It's the greatest gift ever. And we, we can praise God. We can thank God because we know that our sins are forgiven because of what Jesus did. If we put our faith in Christ and we know that our faith is genuine and we put that in Christ, that's the indescribable gift. And so the question is, what is your response to that? Our giving is an expression of our gratitude to God for his indescribable gift. Every time we give, it's an act of worship that's, that has gratitude all in it. It's, it's, it's our saying to God, we are so grateful for what you did for us. Now, all of this is because of God's grace. And it's really, we can call this grace giving because God is even the one who gives us the grace to be able to give anything to him. It's grace giving. In fact, 10 times Paul uses the word grace in, re- in reference to giving in this section here of 2 Corinthians. And that's the way we need to be able to give. With the God's grace in mind, that's the motive. And if you've lost sight of God's grace when it comes to giving, friend, uh, you've, you've lost sight of the real reason to give. And there's two indicators that you might have lost sight of God's grace. First of all, if giving is more of a duty than a delight, you've probably lost sight of the grace of God. You know, if when the offering plate comes around, you just say, well, I'm going to do my duty and get this over with. That's not the proper attitude to have. It should be a joy and a delight to be able to give something and an expression of gratitude to God. The second sign that maybe you've lost sight of God's grace is when you're inconsistent or maybe you give insufficiently to the Lord's work. You know, we say 10% of the tithe, and that's a good measure. But really, in the Old Testament, there were three tithes that people had to pay. 10% is the bare minimum. If you want to get literal, if you want to give three tithes, that's what they did in the Old Testament. And I would just simply say, if under grace you do less than what would have been required under law, then you're probably not responding to God's grace. Grace is never a license just to do the bare minimum. True grace motivates us to abound in obedience out of love for God. Now, with that as a backdrop, I want to give you 10 characteristics of grace giving. That's right, I said 10. Now, I know that I'm probably not going to get through all 10 this morning, so be, be calm. I'm not going to keep you here all afternoon. We'll get, we'll, I'll do the best I can on some of these. But let's look at this. First of all, grace giving is not hindered by poverty. Look in verse number 1 of chapter 8, 2 Corinthians 8, 1. Moreover, brethren, we, do, we would do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in tri- a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. Now, what Paul does here to the Corinthians is he holds up the Macedonians as an example of grace giving. 
Paul doesn't start out with a plea. He starts out by saying, look, I want to give you an example of someone who gives the right way. That's why it says in verse 1, we do you to wit, or we could say, we want you to know, present indicative, active, we want you to continually know of these believers in Macedonia. They are an example of how you are supposed to give. Paul wasn't trying to give the Macedonians a big head. He was using them as an example so that their example would encourage other believers in this matter of giving. They were able to give, Paul says, because of the grace of God that was bestowed upon them. And Paul refers to this enablement that God gave them in order to uh, help them in this collection. And Paul may have been appealing to the competitive nature that existed between the Corinthians and the Macedonians. One speaker said, one writer said this, that um, Paul was willing to appeal to the ancient city and other geographic rivalries to spur his hearers on to greater zeal. And Macedonia and Corinth were rivals. So perhaps Paul was saying, look, I want you to see what Macedonia did. And what are you going to do about that? Uh, and so notice where it says how they gave. It was difficult, but they did it. Look at verse 2. How that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. The, the word great trial here is a, means it documents a time of severe testing. When they were giving, it was in a time of severe testing for them. The word affliction refers to pressure, a, a time of severe pressure. And basically, that region of the world had suffered uh, because of what was going on around them. They suffered the ravages of a civil war between Caesar and Pompey, between Brutus and Cassius, finally between Augustus and Antonius. And, and, and it was so bad for the people in Macedonia that they actually asked for relief from taxation because things were so impoverished. And then again, we add to that the fact that Roman, the Romans were sucking the resources out of that region. They were taking over the gold and silver mines. This region that was one time a pretty rich region had become impoverished. And so Paul says it. Notice where he uses the word there, deep poverty. This means rock-bottom destitution. This word is used to describe a beggar that has absolutely nothing. He has no hope of getting anything. That was their condition. They were impoverished. Yet, they also had joy. That's the grace of God in verse 2, how that in the great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. That is, they had joy also. Even in that circumstance, they still had joy. They were in deep affliction, yet they had joy. And it says it abounded under the riches of their liberality. Think about that. They were focused on giving despite all of that. And so this doesn't really add up. Great trial of affliction, poverty, deep poverty, plus abundant joy equals riches of liberality. With joy, they still gave, is what Paul said. Paul doesn't mention the size of their gift. Because really what's important is the attitude and the sacrifice, not the size. They were generous in the way that they gave. Godly given is measured not in terms of quantity, but in terms of sacrifice. And despite their trials, despite their poverty, they gave generously. And in so doing, they became an example of others on how to give because they trusted God to supply their needs. That's why Paul gave the Philippians the promise, my God shall supply all your needs. You know why? Because they, in the midst of their difficulty, still gave with joy. And so their, their giving, grace giving, was not hindered by poverty. But here's the second thing I want you to see. Grace giving is done sacrificially. Look at verse number three. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. First, they gave according to their power or according to their ability. That is, Paul, and Paul reveals this as a firsthand testimony to their giving. He was there, he saw their poverty, and he was a recipient of their giving. And Paul, that's why Paul says, you know, I can bear record. I was there. They, they gave according to their power. And the principle here is just, look, give what you can. 
In the Old Testament, some brought a lamb, some brought two turtle doves, some brought a handful of grain, which you give according to your ability. But notice that they gave beyond their power, it says in verse number 3. The starting point was they gave according to their ability, but then they went beyond that, and they went from the starting point of what they could do to beyond that to sacrificial giving. They gave sacrificially. Did you know that all worship involves sacrifice? And the greater the sacrifice, the greater the worship. David said in the Old Testament, I will not offer anything that costs me nothing. If it doesn't cost me anything, it's not really a sacrifice. It's not really worship. So I want to give something that costs me. A missionary one time was showing a Christian businessman, Korea, where he was working, and as they were traveling in a field beside the road, there was a young man pulling a crude plow with an old man holding the handles. And the businessman was kind of amused by that. He's, here's this young boy pulling a plow with the old man holding on to the, to, the, to the handles. And it was amusing to this businessman. And the missionary told them the whole story behind this. These were, these were two Christian men. And when their church was being built, they were eager to give something towards it, but they had no money. So they decided to sell their one and only ox to, and give the proceeds to the church. And uh, he said, this spring, they're pulling the plow by themselves. We're glad you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever-Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached, as you've just seen. Our Sunday morning service starts at 11 a.m., so you still have time to join us. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life and he wants you to live out every day of it for his ever-living story. Do you want to study God's Word in greater depth, but you can't leave town or your job to attend seminary? Faith Theological Seminary of Catonsville is a Bible-believing, evangelical, non-denominational seminary with professors that have earned PhDs in their fields of instruction. We have a beautiful campus on North Rolling Road, just west of the city of Baltimore. We offer Biblical Studies degrees at the Associates and Bachelor's levels, along with a Master of Divinity in Chaplaincy and a Doctor of Ministry in Expository Preaching. Our tuition is affordable, and some scholarships are available. We operate under an exemption from the Maryland Higher Education Commission, granting us authority to offer advanced educational instruction and degrees in Religious Studies. Visit our website at ftscatonsville.org or call our offices at 410-788-6132. We look forward to seeing you study God's Word with us.